All right. Good afternoon again to everyone joining us. Uh, very exciting. We have 95 registrants for today's webinar uh, from all different uh, parts of the globe. Uh, I saw United Arab Emirates. I've seen Egypt. I saw Russia, uh, I saw a lot of European countries as well, the Canadians are in, the Americans from different uh, different parts, so welcome to our uh, market access and regulatory update for the medical technology industry in Germany, part of our healthcare webinar series. I am uh, Omar Owais, Director of Investor Consulting uh, for the healthcare industry uh, at Germany Trade and Invest, and I'm dialed in from Washington, D.C., and I'll be your moderator for today's webinar. If you're joining us for the first time, uh, welcome. Um, real quick, Germany Trade Invest, or GTAI, is the economic development agency for Germany. We do obviously a lot of different things. What does that mean? Well, uh, we have various tasks and we wear uh, multiple hats. Uh, we obviously market Germany as a business and a technology location. We uh, promote economic uh, development, obviously, in uh, all the states, as well as the new federal states, as well as Berlin, and we work with those regional players. We provide uh, export uh, and market information to the German economy and to German companies as well, looking to internationalize. And uh, we also uh, have uh, business uh, consultancy services for international investors, and that includes uh, market and industry reports, uh, tax and legal information in Germany, funding and financing opportunities, as well as uh, partnering uh, and site selection in Germany. Real quick, uh, this is our healthcare webinar series. We have uh, multiple webinar series, but obviously this one is catered to the healthcare industry. Um, we have a URL dedicated to our um, healthcare webinar series. That's uh, gti.com forward slash succeed in German healthcare, as you see. This is our third webinar, <clears throat> excuse me, of the year. Uh, we've obviously touched upon digital healthcare, as you can see, as well as the medical cannabis industry in Germany. And today is obviously focused on medtech. Uh, past webinars, uh, you can also you can pull up on that URL. Um, we've touched upon the biopharmaceutical industry, um, apps and mobile health solutions, and again, you do see market access and regulatory update there back in 2016 because obviously there's, there are ongoing revisions taking place, and it is one of our uh, hottest topics. We have three <clears throat> speakers lined up for you today. Mr. Gabriel Fleming from Germany Trade and Invest, Mr. Stefan Aval, uh, Cardium Inc. out of Vancouver, and Mr. Gerd Gottschalk from Gerd Consulting out of Germany as well. I want to encourage uh, you, I already have seen a question come in, which is fantastic. I want to encourage you to use your chat feature on the right. Um, we will have a Q&A session at the end. We will let the three presenters uh, present first. Um, you can send me those questions at any time. You will not interrupt the presentations. Uh, use that chat feature on the right-hand side, and we will get to that uh, Q&A session at the very end following the, the presentation. At this point, I do want to begin with um, our first speaker, uh, as I said, Mr. Gabriel Fleming, senior manager uh, in our healthcare team. He's uh, at our Berlin headquarters for Germany Trade and Invest, and um, I've known uh, I've known Gabriel for about eight years. He's a dear colleague and a, and a dear friend. Um, he is responsible for our medical device, our dental, and our reimbursement. Uh, I should say he's responsible for medical device, the dental, and uh, our reimbursement expert. Um, and he is an avid sailor. So at this point, I am going to hand over the rights to him, and we look forward to his presentation. All right, and welcome from Berlin. This is Gabriel speaking. Thanks, Omar, for the very kind introduction. Uh, yeah, I can return the, uh, the compliments. I've been working with you for eight years, too, and have been enjoying the time very much. Uh, among others, you uh, are a avid pilot, I might say. So I am going to give you my um, introduction to the uh, clinical trial and reimbursement and market access complex here in, in Germany. Certainly my pleasure to address uh, this international audience here of international medical device manufacturers throughout the world. Uh, we're actually just three weeks ahead of Medica and uh, that will be a great uh, opportunity to meet in person if you're interested. Um, we could sit down for a half hour and discuss your personal case if you will be joining the show. I will be giving you a quick helicopter view 
uh, update on the medical device regulation and reimbursement situation here, uh, which will then be followed by detailed accounts from Stefan of Cardium, uh, based in Vancouver, and Gerd of uh, Gerd Consulting, based um, close to Düsseldorf. Doing so, I will be pointing out what kind of support you can expect from GTAI, that's Germany Trade and Invest, in your specific and individual expansion case. All right, uh, the German market for medical te technology is worth 34 billion euros as of t last year, 2016. And of course, it would be one of GTAI's core competencies to provide market intelligence to you guys, explain how things are done here, who is who, etc. Germany offers the largest market for medical technology in Europe, that's widely known, and it's actually only behind the US and Japan globally. Germany is a successful manufacturing platform in the way that um, medical technology made in Germany is worth 28 billion euros and actually two-thirds of that is being exported primarily into Europe but also to North America, Asia and the Middle East as the most important markets. Nevertheless, imports are significant uh, into Germany with 15 billion euros worth of medtech being imported last year, mostly from within Europe and North America. Uh, if you want to find out about Germany's value-added tax system and import duties and, and things like that, you're, you are very welcome to uh, send me an email. I have my contact details on my last slide and we can take a close look at that, for example. All right, uh, German hospitals can be your clients and they can be your partners uh, at the same time regarding market access perspective. And there are many options as we have close to 2,000 hospitals with 500,000 hospital beds throughout the entire country. And we at GTAI can actually help you find partners in the hospital sector when it comes to clinical evaluation and clinical trials and potential product adaptation to the market, uh, to the German market. You will of course find operators of medical devices in our 1500 prevention and rehabilitation facilities also, and in the over 12,000 nursing homes that we have. We're not only talking about the uh, hospitals as a potential inpatient setting, if you will. This can be very relevant for diagnostics and monitoring product providers, I guess, with, um, with plenty of people living in these places and taking good care of their health and needing uh, monitoring, constant monitoring on a daily basis, for example. Hospital spending is ever increasing in Germany, which is uh, good news for the industry, of course. Public hospitals run by the county and city administrations account for the largest part. Uh, with about 44 billion euro spending in 2015, it's the latest uh, statistic that we were able to get, uh, followed by charity-based and on third place private hospitals. Public hospitals also have the most beds, of course, with about half of the 500,000 beds, while the private sector accounts for some 20%. Legal information. This is absolutely at the core of market access, of course. Um, you're very welcome to approach us for getting legal information. Uh, we have um, an internal team to um, research any individual question that you might have. So from the basic outlook from the get-go, in, in order to sell in Germany, you need to comply with European, European Union regulation as well as German regulation. On the left side here, I have compressed the situation into a high-level checklist, if you will, for regulatory clearance. Uh, most importantly, you're facing the European Union Medical Device Directives, of course, that's the MDD framework, uh, to adhere to in order to get the CE mark. Uh, that's widely known. In addition, you have German MPG law, uh, medical product law, for medical products to comply with, but it is fair to say that this is not so much a challenge uh, compared to the European uh, CE framework. Non-EU companies with a subsidiary in the EU will have to assign 
an authorized person to the authorities and under the German MPG law you're uh, actually required uh, to identify a safety contact in addition uh, and in case something goes wrong authorities can get in touch with you uh, directly. Usually this is actually the same person uh, like the EU authorized person. Once you're beginning to sell your you are to notify the German Institute of Medical Documentation and Information, the DIMD. There's actually no need to register first as a manufacturer like in other countries. And we actually already had one of, uh, one, one of the attendees pose that question in, into our system here. So the answer is uh, there's no need to register as a manufacturer per se in Germany. There's no legal requirement to generate clinical evidence in Germany either, but those who intend to run cli clinical trials in Germany will have to apply uh, at the Federal Institute for Drugs and Medical Devices, the B Farm. Uh, I think actually Stefan of Cardium uh, in, in Vancouver, uh, being the following speaker, will let us know which steps they took on the way to um, starting their clinical center in Leipzig. How to achieve and declare conformity with uh, European medical device regulation um, is about to change in the near future. As most of you are aware, uh, we have a new framework, the MDR, taking effect actually in three years, in 2020, which we will be replacing the current MDD. The R in MDR means that this EU legal framework is uh, rated a regulative, which from the legal status is to be uh, translated directly into national law uh, throughout the European Union. And this is um, a higher hierarchy uh, legal level than the previous medical device directive. The upcoming MDR will force manufacturers actually of uh, class three high risk products to run clinical trials of their own and to provide clinical evidence of their own. It is not sufficient to refer to existing literature. This is the uh, very significant change. For them, a new uh, scrutiny procedure will be managed uh, mainly by the notified bodies that we already know that are assessing, will be assessing the clinical evidence and reporting this to a new European body actually, yet to be established the so-called Medical Device Coordination Group, uh, this is the new body, will in turn permit the notified body to proceed with the certification or intervene in the process. It's intended by the European lawmakers here to harmonize the previously differing notified bodies' levels of quality through, throughout the Union and, and of uh, levels of quality and safety across the Union and it's widely anticipated that uh, notified bodies, they will be struggling to become recertified as a notified bodies under the future MDR. And it's, it's expected that it will take some time for them to build up the necessary capacities to assess the quantity of clinical evidence that will be coming into the market. Will also take time to establish the uh, medical device coordination group on the European level, and actually a stable work, a stable working routine between the the MD, uh, the medical device coordination group, and the notified bodies. For class three manufacturers looking at the German and other European markets, this means they should be preparing for uh, providing their own clinical evidence and prepare to run trials. They should familiarize themselves with the situation of the notified body they have been working with previously or engage in communication with a notified body in case they have not yet achieved a CE mark. Very likely the notified bodies will be facing a significantly increased demand for their services. Now to the reimbursement side of uh, market access checklists here. The relevant legal framework here is the German social code. SGB, Sozialgesetzbuch. There is no European legislation concerning reimbursement whatsoever. Our webinar's final speaker, Gerd Gottschalk, will later on explore the two paragraphs 
that are vital for the sustainable reimbursement of class 3 innovations where clinical evidence is important in the inpatient sector. He will have actually one slide each for paragraph 137E and 137H. One slide each. This is the crucial change in the German reimbursement scheme which manufacturers should be anticipating. Um, at the bottom line is that the introduction of this regulation last year uh, clinical evidence is required for increasing the reimbursement of an innovative device in the inpatient sector compared to the established prior art method. The German reimbursement system is very open to innovation as long as it does not cost more than prior art. This is a very important thing to understand. Any safe product can be reimbursed under prior art operations and procedures codes, OPS, codes and DRG codes. In order to access this uh, system, the manufacturer of a new class 3 device will typically try to partner with a clinical user, ideally a key opinion leader in Germany and his medical controller within the hospital. And in most cases, a specialized consultant will do the operative work in this regard. The manufacturer will very likely be applying for increased reimbursement for his product, which ideally proves to be better than prior art, and thus will be approved NUB status. This is uh, the NUB status is an acronym for Novel Diagnosis and Treatment Methods, uh, which will uh, get its own OPS codes and increased sustainable reimbursement in that course. In summary, uh, clinical evidence has become a key issue for the reimbursement side of market access in Germany as of last year. To some degree, it has already been a key issue from the regulatory side of market access, but with new CE scrutiny regulation approaching, it will be even more so. With clinical evidence at the center of both sides of the medal here, uh, the regulatory side, the reimbursement side, manufacturers are increasingly uh, integrating actually their CE and reimbursement strategies and in that sense uh, the bottom line here is that uh, the checklist shown here would probably not be tackled separately uh, nor in sequence but simultane simultaneously at least in the case of novel class 3 products so finally we have seen many factors, uh, many manufacturers establish uh, re a representative office in, in Germany as soon as they seriously engage their business development over here. And of course, it's part of our site selection service to help uh, and find the right spot for you as there are so many places where your GBMBH could be set up. The blue circles here on the map uh, actually represent the density of medical device manufacturers based in Germany. So this gives you an idea of where the biggest manufacturing clusters are to be found. Um, this might be a good way to find out where you should be um, placing your office. The white bowls represent our medical technology innovation clusters. For example, we have the European Medical Valley in Nuremberg Erlangen area, area in, in the southeast, in, in Bavaria actually. And 24 of these clusters, innovation clusters, are certified by the EU cluster audit system. And every single one of them has their own management staff taking care of business incubators, R&D collaboration programs, you know, incentives, um, subsidies, etc. We have 33 university hospitals in Germany which provide important resources for those uh, in innovation clusters. For example, you can find uh, access to your key opinion leaders here uh, needed to boost your case in Germany actually uh, by evaluating your product or even engaging in clinical trials with you. Leipzig would be an example in many ways uh, regarding cardiovascular topics as the clinicians there have established very high reputation. And I think uh, Stefan will be um, sharing some of their experience with initiating their clinical trial center in Leipzig actually. 
So before I finish my presentation, let me actually invite you again to meet us personally at Medica in Düsseldorf. Uh, we will have a new pavilion and a great program of free presentation sessions with manufacturers, health insurance representatives, consultants, etc. Uh, so there will certainly be the opportunity to sit down and discuss your case personally. Of course, you can also contact me here in Berlin anytime via email or phone. And uh, that's it for now. Having said all that, it's bye-bye from Berlin. And I will ask Omar to switch over to Stefan. Thank you. Thank you, Gabriel. I really appreciate that overview. I'm going to take back the rights. All right, if you need uh, CVs or any other information on our speakers, uh, you can find that at our URL at the bottom of my slides, uh, the Succeed in German Healthcare. Thank you, Gabriel. Our next speaker, uh, Mr. Stefan Aval. Uh, good morning to you, first of all. He's dialed in from Vancouver, Canada. Um, he, uh, he works uh, for Cardium, Inc. Um, he is going to touch upon uh, clinical trials in Germany, something they just did. Um, we met Stefan over a year ago. He joined us as a webinar participant, uh, actually, uh, and became a client of GTAI. Um, after finding an appropriate partner in Germany, um, he has kindly returned as a speaker uh, in our webinar series as, and, and, and as a testimonial, excuse me. So we look forward to his presentation. Stefan, right's coming over to you. Thank you, Omar, for that introduction, and thank you, everybody, for uh, attending this webinar today. So, um, so as Omar mentioned, I work for Cardium. Uh, it's a company we're based out on the west coast of Canada, and we've been around for about uh, ten and a half years so far. And we've developed a device for the treatment of atrial fibrillation. Uh, myself, I'm a product manager as well as the clinical study manager <clears throat> of the study that I'll be talking about today. And in Vancouver, we we have all of our facilities hosted there: our manufacturing, regulatory, engineering. And, uh, and and everything there is under one roof. So just briefly on, on the device that, uh, that uh, we've developed, it's the Globe Mapping and Ablation System. It's a uh, percutaneous catheter device that enters the heart uh, up through the femoral vein from the groin. Um, there's a couple different components to the device. There's the catheter itself, uh, which is, uh, you can see the, the picture of the array there. That's what enters the left atrium of the patient. Um, all of those uh, gold gold electrodes there. The purpose of those is to measure electrical signals inside of the heart to, to help the physician diagnose and understand what's going on with the, the patient's atrial fibrillation. And those uh, electrodes can also deliver therapy. Uh, the treatment of AFib is, or atrial fibrillation is to create lesion lines, or lines of scar tissue inside the heart to try to change how the electrical signals are propagating to try to treat the disease. And so each of those electrodes can, can both measure electrical signals as well as deliver uh, radio frequency energy to help uh, deliver the therapy. There's also, of course, a software piece to the device as well as uh, an, an RF generator that controls everything. And just for um, uh, understanding some of the, the points I'm talking about, about our experience with the clinical study and approvals, this device is a uh, class three device. So some of the, the uh, approval steps I'm talking about may not apply for lower risk devices, um, but, but they definitely do for, for devices of this risk class. So the study uh, that we just uh, completed the treatment phase of uh, in Europe and in Germany as well, uh, specifically, uh, as well as Switzerland, is, was our uh, pre-market study. And so the, the main purpose of the study was to gather clinical evidence that will be uh, used when we apply for the CE mark uh, for market approval in Europe later this year. Um, as, as, as Gabriel mentioned, uh, we will be doing that by applying to a notified body and, and who will be reviewing uh, the, the clinical evidence as well as the other testing and other documentation that we provide. And I'll echo his sentiments about uh, the new regulations and the impact on notified bodies. It's really important to start your search for a notified body early uh, as uh, they're already they're getting much busier and their schedules are getting more full in terms of taking on new uh, new clients. So that is something that you need to be focused on as you get closer to uh, to your application for the CE mark. So just uh, briefly on the study, um, it was a prospective study, just a single arm study, 
and uh, 60 patients were treated total, uh, all treated this year, and 16 of those were in Germany at the uh, Heart Center in Leipzig. And it's primarily a safety study looking at uh, the, the SAE rate within seven days and also some efficacy endpoints such as uh, our ability to isolate the pulmonary veins during the procedure, the acute PVI, and also looking, we will be following the patients for one year to see if they remain uh, free from atrial fibrillation. So wanted to speak a bit about why we uh, chose to run uh, part of our study in Germany. Uh, so our initial product launch will be in Europe. It's quite a common path to market for medical device companies with new devices. Uh, the reason for that is the, uh, the the relative barriers to entry for Europe versus the US, the two major markets in the world, um, often favors uh, new devices going to Europe. Germany, of course, will be a very important market for us. It's a big market. Um, Gert will talk a bit more in detail about reimbursement, but it's quite a, a good reimbursement system there in terms of rates and the process, um, especially it's a national reimbursement system, whereas in some other countries in Europe, uh, you'll have to go region by region uh, to get reimbursement, which, which adds a lot of complexity and time, where, where Germany that's not required. It also has excellent uh, infrastructure for running studies of, of the of the kind that we just uh, that, that we're currently in, in progress. Uh, excellent hospitals, uh, doctors who are globally recognized and, uh, and and regularly talk at conferences, and also hospitals who are experienced uh, working with new devices, which, which is quite important because you know new devices always have uh, their intricacies, and and it's, it's great to work with teams who are used to that and used to you know learning the the new devices and, and bringing them into the clinic. And so uh, our protocol, we, we ran with just one German center, but we actually had three uh, centers on the protocol. In addition to Leipzig, we had the Heart Center in Dresden, as well as uh, a clinic in Frankfurt. And so the way that we went about selecting our partners, which is an important part of, uh, of conducting a study like this, is we really wanted to have doctors who are out there regularly publishing and presenting uh, you know, big papers uh, at the major conferences, because while well, the main purpose of this study is for the regulatory approval. Of course, it's, it's going to be the first piece of clinical evidence that we want to use to, uh, to help communicate the value and, and the benefits of the device. And uh, again, we want doc wanted doctors who are used to working with, with new devices and, and understanding how they work. Uh, in terms of how we, how we recruited the doctors, this is something that we started many years ago, um, early on in the development of the device. It's something that takes time as, as you both build a relationship with the doctors and also try to see who's, who uh, is a good fit to work with. And, and after initial meetings, of course, we would, uh, as we had new developments, we'd regularly meet with them just to keep them updated on our progress and, and uh, keep them familiar with, with how the device is progressing. So the approvals in Germany, um, it's a, overall a fairly smooth process. Uh, there's, there's two different submissions. Uh, one is to BFARM, um, which is uh, kind of analogous to the FDA in the US. Uh, they're the competent authority uh, looking at you know, many different parts of the device, as well as the ethics committees. The nice thing in Germany is that this is a centralized submission through the DIMD website, all online. Um, so you can enter all the documents in one place. Uh, the submissions are separate on the system, but it's easy to cut and paste between them. Um, you know, as opposed to some other uh, some other areas, and you know, our, our experience in Switzerland was was you had to mail in binders uh, to the different authorities, which you know is not overly onerous, but it's definitely much smoother to uh, to work online. And it's not. Uh, you don't need to have all of your documentation in German, uh, which is uh, which is a big help. Although the questions will be coming back from B Farm and the ethics committees in German, so it's good to have either in-house uh, language expertise or uh, at least someone who can uh, a translation service who can help with that. You'll also need to nominate a coordinating ethics committee for the approvals, and. So their, their job is to help coordinate uh, collection of information and, and distribution to the different committees if you're doing a multi-center study uh, covered by different ethics committees. And so it's important to spend some time thinking about who to choose for that role as uh, you know, they're quite important to keeping the, the, uh, the approval moving forward. So just to give you an idea of how long these, uh, these types of uh, reviews take, I've just summarized our experience here. Both of the reviews have two main phases. Uh, it starts with the screening phase, and then there's the review phase. The screening phase is really about looking at the completeness of the submission, but they will also ask for some more uh, detailed information. Uh, one of the questions we got 
was to provide our full risk analysis, uh, not just the summary that was in the submission, as well as a copy of all the test reports that we referenced in our submission. And you have 14 days to provide that uh, or you get kicked out uh, out of the system and have to reapply. So it's very important that when you are when you do submit your application that you do have all these supporting documents uh, ready to go um, so that you can uh, reply quickly to the regulators. Uh, overall, uh, the overall timeline here was about three months. Uh, so after we passed the screening phase, uh, we had two rounds of questions in the review phase that we were able to handle um, you know, fairly well, and then we ultimately got approval in the middle of May, or at the end of May. The Ethics Committee timeline, in contrast, is a bit longer. As you can see, it was about two months longer uh, for the review there. And, but again, it was um, split up the same way with initial screening. Uh, there was two rounds of screening questions there, um, as there were some, some little questions towards the end that we needed to address, and then the, the ultimate application review. And so you can see here this, uh, this timeline was a bit closer to five months, so uh, a bit longer. Um, a bit longer here. And, and one thing I'll point out from our experience is we actually got approval uh, in the middle of July but did not receive that approval until the end. Uh, something got hung up in, internally at the Ethics Committee. So, you know, if you are expecting approvals, it's always good to, you know, not too often, but to reach out and just uh, ask if, uh, you know, just to try to get an update on, on what the timing is, is sometimes things can get uh, stuck up uh, during the review. So our experience in Germany, overall, it's been excellent. Uh, the doctors, as we had hoped, uh, were very, very good to work with, uh, very highly skilled, very adept at understanding our device. The hospital staff as well were, were excellent. And uh, our study monitors, which are the staff who, who go on site and review the documentation during the study, uh, they were very, very good to work with and, and uh, added a lot of value to the project. And also, everything went quite smoothly. Um, you know, even though we didn't have any German speakers on the on-site team, we were able to get on-site and install the equipment and, and get everything worked out and, and the training conducted uh, very easily. Um, so that, that went very smoothly. And, and overall logistics, as, as you would expect, were uh, we had no big hang-ups there, uh, getting things organized and getting things running. And last, I'd just like to say a couple words about uh, Germany Trade and Invest. I would definitely recommend contacting them when you start thinking about uh, potentially entering Germany with with uh, your project, whether it's commercial launch or a clinical study, um, they have a, a wide range of expertise in-house and also with people that they work with regularly and on, on a range of topics uh, from reimbursement to hiring uh, and also when and, and how you would end up setting a legal entity in Germany depending on the phase of your project. So definitely worth uh, contacting them and to, to understand the differences and in, in, in regulations in Germany. And so thank you very much. Uh, for your time today. If, if you have any questions, please use the chat feature in the webinar. And also, if you think of something afterwards, uh, here's my contact information. Thank you, Stefan, uh, for that kind pitch. And also, very happy to hear that uh, that, that things were very smooth for you uh, the last couple of months. And great presentation. All right. Yes, uh, we have received a few questions. We will ask those questions uh, in the Q&A session at the very end, but uh, a quick one I can answer is uh, the webinar is being recorded, um, and you will receive a notification of when it is available to review, uh, as well as the presentations, all presentations and speaker bios and their contact information will be available to all of our attendees. Last but not least, uh, Mr. Gerd Gottschalk, a consultant at Gerd Consulting in Kreuzau, Germany. Uh, Gerd has actually spoken on our webinar a couple of years ago. Um, he's a great speaker. Um, he has extensive years of experience with uh, the medtech industry, the health insurance landscape in Germany. Um, clients of his have included Coloplast, Medtronic, GI Dynamics, and Autonomic Technologies. Uh, he's proven uh, to be successful at market access and reimbursement uh, for many companies, uh, and he started his own consulting company in 2016. And I personally think it's kind of cool that uh, Gat is also uh, the you know that your first name is part of that consulting uh, name. So company name, maybe I'm sure you'll get into that. So Gat, I will hand over the rights to you, and we look forward to your presentation. Yes, thank you, Omar, uh, for uh, handing over.
over and for the nice interaction. Um, and hello, everybody in line. Um, so, um, and I'm very glad uh, to speak about the clinical trial as a part of reimbursement uh, strategy. And as Omar mentioned, I have uh, several years experience within a payer organization in Germany and medtech industry and introduced, uh, for example, continuous glucose monitoring uh, or a device for to treat type 2 diabetes and obesity um, within uh, Germany and uh, Europe. And uh, the last device what I introduced is a pulsant microstimulator, which is indicated for cluster headache patients. Um, the presentation um, has three um, parts, uh, general objective of reimbursement, very briefly, then the clinical strategy in total, some aspects and uh, the evidence assessments mentioned by Gabriel in this presentation before. Uh, so the technique is difficult. So. Um, in general, the, um, the uh, general goal of uh, reimbursement is the achievement of standard of care uh, within a specific um, indication and within a specific treatment method. It leads by knowledge, uh, understanding, acceptance, confidence, uh, contribution, and uh, to standard of care. And everywhere between confidence and standard of care, the questions coming up who will finance this and how is the procedure reimbursed. Um, if you would like to achieve standard of care, you need reimbursement. So we would like to say no reimbursement, uh, no market. Um, the point of view where we are looking to reimbursement is the cost-benefit ratio, especially the payer organization, and there are some, some um, terms like Quali and ISA, which are well known, uh, especially from the UK area, Netherlands. Uh, in Germany, we are talking about the efficacy border, and each of these um, systems or each of these um, um, areas are requested uh, if your device is more costly and more effective uh, instead of the standard of care, uh, what you compare with. What's about the clinical strategy? Um, the clinical, uh, there is an uh, evidence pyramid, which is the ranking of the evidence, and uh, payer organizations are really focused on the top of this evidence. It means if you would like to apply for reimbursement, you have to have controlled studies in place. Everything above the the green case here, it's um, it's okay as more as better. It means if you have a randomized, blinded, charm controlled study in place, it's better instead of a randomized controlled trial, it's better than a cohort study with a control group. Uh, but in the end of the day, you need to show that your therapy and your device is working better and get a better outcome uh, compared to other um, devices or compared to uh, um, uh, treatment pathways uh, without a medical device. For this, you have different um, parameters where you can fit in. Um, one is the type of the study, as I mentioned before. Uh, the second is the hypothesis. Uh, what is the questions? What need to be answered? Uh, then you have to look at the population and the indication. Um, and this does not necessarily mean that you you're using the same population group, which is uh, approved by your, by the CE mark. Um, mostly, you have to uh, limit it uh, and to be more focused on special indication, inclusion, exclusion criteria. Um, if you go for type two diabetes and obesity, it's not accepted to say, okay, everybody who has uh, type two diabetes and obesity can assess this new um, treatment method and these new devices. Um, so, um, on the other side, you have to look for the number of patients, which is in relation to the, um, to the uh, indication. As bigger your indication group, as more patients you need to include in your, um, in your study to get the um, statistical power uh, in place. 
Um, you have to look um, what you are comparing, uh, what is your comparator, is it standard of care, for example, um, pharmaco treatments, or is it a treatment with another um, medical device? Um, if you have a device, a neurostimulating device for back pain, then you can compare it with uh, the painkillers, and you can compare it as well with um, other devices which are available in the market. Um, and this need to be written into the study protocol and need to figure out what is the best way to compare. Um, you have to look at the primary and secondary output parameters and um, payers uh, are telling you that the uh, zero cut parameters are not really accepted, um, despite really that, for example, type 2 diabetes or diabetes treatment is well common and measured by the HbA1c, um, but in the end of the day you have to put in as well patient-related patient outcome parameters, um, for example, um, quality of life parameters um, or um, other um, comorbidities which could be avoided by um, improvement in diabetes management. Uh, the period of observation, it's very important. Um, the request of long-term data, it's, uh, it's huge uh, and that it's something what you need to balance out before um, that the, the duration of the study it's not exploding and on the other side uh, you need to fulfill the request from the payers um, to get, get give a really good um, an overview that your device it's working over a longer time period instead of five or six months so mostly they are looking for one or two year data um, which could um, this data could be gathered in a useful follow-up or in a subgroup of the patients and uh, you need to consider that uh, these data are requested by the uh, health insurance funds and the payer organizations. Quality management as well, it's very important and the timing um, of, the, uh, of the study uh, means uh, if you it finished the study, it does not necessarily mean that the data are available. Uh, you have to have the analysis, you have to um, write this down, and um, only data are considered which are published in a journal. And as well, you need to, to select a useful journal um, which, is, which will publish your data and your um, outcome of the clinical study. So, to show you one example, in, uh, which is necessarily not, uh, unfortunately, not a really uh, a, a good example, but it it's, uh, makes this uh, dilemma sometimes a little bit more uh, visible. Um, these are studies driven within the type 2 diabetes and obesity field, and you see in the indication that the studies are shifting from the one to the other um, indication. Um, and as well, you have uh, these studies are conducted in different um, in countries, in mostly in South America, and only one study or two studies are um, developed in, in Europe, and that is something which is criticized by the payer organization um, due to the fact that there are different regulations in these areas. Um, you have a number, a certain number of patients, which does not match really to the um, to the population. Type two diabetes and obesity. It's a huge, it's a massive population, and look for these only very, very small patient groups um, implanted with this device. Um, the design as well um, over a time frame of five, four years, uh, only one RCT was developed um, in the. This is the second study. Uh, all other studies are single arm or out, uh, out uh, label use, off label use um, in these studies, which are not uh, respected by the payer organization as well. And um, also, there's a huge variety between the BMI as a patient included between 30 BMI points and 60 BMI points, which is a, a massive variation um, of the indicated or included uh, patients. In this case, you cannot build really sufficient subgroups to say, okay, which 
patient who will benefit the most from this therapy. And these are the, really the bottlenecks and the, the gaps of this clinical strategy driven by this company. Coming to the last part of this presentation, um, talking a little bit about the, um, the pathways in Germany. Um, first of all, we consider that we have two pathways. The one is for the inpatient treatment and the other is for the outpatient. If you have the inpatient, it means hospital care required, there is a reservation of a provision means you can use the device within the system and um, if you have an OPS code and a DRG group it will be paid. It, doesn't, uh, not, uh, it does not mean necessarily that it's paid sufficiently but it's paid in, in, in one way. Uh, if you go to the outpatient uh, area where the patient is handling this um, device actively, uh, there is a ration of a permission um, and you need to have uh, to have uh, approval before you can sell and uh, before the, the device and the treatment will be reimbursed by the German health insurance funds. Um, to achieve both, um, you need evidence in the end of the day. Um, uh, in the outpatient area, you need the evidence at the beginning. In the inpatient, you need it in a later stage. Um, but um, you can imagine that the payers would like to have this early evidence assessment as well in the, um, in the inpatient area and therefore there, there is a new process in place uh, uh, since this year for, um, to achieve uh, earlier um, uh, evidence in Germany. So, um, looking to the outpatient, it's a 137E uh, paragraph in uh, Germany. You have this innovation, you, you have to have to apply for the approval. Um, and in the end of the day, after the review um, of, this, uh, um, of your application, there are four uh, possible outcomes. The first is in that it's brilliant, you have an acceptance, uh, you meet the, all the criteria, you have enough evidence, and then it's approved, um, which is very rare uh, in this case. Uh, the second one it's a, uh, if you have not enough evidence but a proven potential means potential as a required treatment alternatives coming from the data what you are providing to the, um, to the authorities then they can decide to make a trial period and which is uh, um, um, coverage by evidence development means there, is, there will be set up a trial and conducted the trial and within this trial all procedures and all devices will be paid by the German health insurance funds. Um, they can skip this uh, due to the fact that there is a, a proven potential but there are ongoing studies which will lead and which will answer the questions, the open questions uh, within a, in a, a specific time frame. Um, then they can say, okay, we will wait, uh, still wait, uh, or they can exclude it because of there is no benefit um, um, visible within the study so far, there is no potential, it's, it's harmful or ineffective, and that is a huge risk uh, if you get this decision, you are out of the market and um, it's very, very difficult to apply again um, to change this um, these decision uh, uh, over time. Um, certain time periods. You have minimum to wait two years to reapply for, for, um, for these the treatment methods. The timing of this process in the outpatient area, it's around uh, between 8 and 15 years. It's a huge variation, uh, but it's a very formal process with a lot of public consultations uh, uh, between the, or within this process and it's, it's very, very difficult to drive in. So, in the opposite to that, there is the inpatient area, which is the 137H um, uh, uh, paragraph. This is requested by high-risk devices, class 3 or active um, implants. Um, and these treatment methods need to, to be based on a new scientific concept. Um, means uh, that, that it's, a, it's really an innovative um, uh, product. Um, this could be as well if you use, for example, a neurostimulation technique in, for a different indication or in a different area of the body. That means also that it's a new scientific concept. Um, in this case, you have 
two pathways and which are running in parallel. The so one is the normal um, NUB application, well known in the past. Hospitals uh, will apply for additional payment to the ENEC institution. Um, they get the NUB status. Uh, this application needs to be done until the end of uh, October. Uh, the decision will be made until the end of January by the ENEC institution and then you get status, hopefully status one, where you can negotiate additional payment with the um, health insurance funds. Simultaneous to this, um, the manufacturer in cooperation with the hospital need to send a dossier, uh, which is a mini HTA, to the Federal Joint Committee, um, and this will be assessed within um, approximately four months. And in the end, you have also this uh, decision uh, tree angel. No potential means exclusion of uh, this uh, procedure. Potential means develop a trial, uh, which uh, which will be paid, or all procedures paid by the uh, uh, health insurance funds, and the manufacturer has to pay the overhead of the uh, clinical trial. This will lead to a significant and high value uh, evidence uh, in this area. And uh, the second one, which is very, very rare, you have enough evidence at, at the beginning and you get the proof directly. Um, this process will lead three to five years, maybe a little bit shorter. It depends very strongly on the duration of the, um, the clinical trial. And as you can imagine, the during the trial will be paid by or will be supported from the German government and therefore they will have influence on the study design and the good thing you have the chance to to have the first approach and to give an idea about the your study what you would like to do and um, um, it's very strongly requested to have uh, key opinion leaders within the board. So in the end some takeaways, RCTs, RCTs, control, control, control. This is what the reimbursement agencies are looking for. Um, look for the clinical and reimbursement strategy before CE mark. Uh, um, if you have a chance to make a high quality study to achieve CE mark, it's the best way. So you have both in one uh, study. Um, you need to have the support of medical societies, it means uh, look for a good um, QL management uh, in the country. Um, look for public consultation processes. Uh, public consultation processes which are available in Germany as well. You can apply for, or you can ask if you have a device which fulfills this uh, NUB um, uh, process application uh, requirements. Is there a scientific background or not? Is this new? Um, and uh, look for country focus with the European international perspective because of other countries are looking to Germany and Germany as well is looking to other countries. That's all. Thank you, Gerd. We'll leave that slide up for just a second, um, just uh, in case folks want to contact you via email. Um, yeah. As you can all see, thank you to everyone's uh, patience and, uh, you know, it's very, very complicated uh, to, to uh, summarize this in the 12 to 15 minutes. So I really want to thank all my speakers for doing such a great job. Yeah. At this point, we'll move to the Q&A session. Uh, we only have a few minutes left. I want to respect everyone's time. And we do have some questions already, so I'm going to get right into it. Um, First question from Emmett. Um, my company is registered in Ireland and I have a CE marked product. Do I need to register in Germany? Maybe a question for Gert. So, so um, the question, the first question back is, is an inpatient or outpatient? If you have an outpatient and you would like to work like a supplier uh, to support patients, you have to be um, a subsidiary here in Germany and you need to be registered like an um, acceptance provider, a healthcare provider. Uh, if you are in an inpatient, you don't need necessarily to have a subsidiary in Germany, but it's, um, it's suggested to think about that because of the different legal um, um, backgrounds, uh, there's different. Uh, there are some difference between Ireland and Germany. Thank you, Gert. Next question. Um, this is actually for Stefan Aval. Uh, can Stefan give a sense of the costs 
not exact details, but orders of magnitude and fees to the German authorities? Thank you, Dorothy, for that question. So, <clears throat> in terms of costs, um, so I'm not too familiar with what the fees were uh, for the application. Um, that's probably something that you could look for on the DIMD website, or uh, maybe Garrett has that information. Uh, and then in terms of the the costs to the hospitals, it's it's uh, much less uh, uh, much lower cost than in the U.S. Um, you know, you're kind of on the order of magnitude on probably low thousands or uh, high hundreds, depending on the complexity of your study per patient. Um, where in the U.S. it can be, you know, uh, 10 or more times that amount. Uh, and then general costs in terms of, uh, you know, your accommodation in that, I mean, that's, you know, Germany is quite a, a reasonable uh, cost there. Our other study center in Zurich was a much higher cost center for the those types of logistics in terms of uh, staffing if you have people on site during the study. Thank you, Stefan. Gert, anything else you could possibly add on costs or that was a great answer? No, it was a great answer. I'm not familiar with these uh, fees for DIMD or um, Ethicom T. I don't know. Thank, thank you, Stefan. Uh, next question um, from Anastasios. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to ask which is the body that evaluates medical devices and decides for their reimbursement or not? I thought the hospital decides which devices will buy and they get reimbursed through general OP codes. That question makes sense. Maybe a I question, guess it's a question for Go ahead, <laughs> so, In general, it's right. Um, in general, um, uh, um, the um, uh, uh, the daily work is different. So, um, in general, the hospital decides, and the uh, the physician decides which device he is using, and uh, he can um, code it to get reimbursement from the health insurance funds. But the health insurance funds, well. Um, back to Gert, sorry, Gert, sorry, you were you were chopped up the last maybe ten seconds or so. Maybe you could uh, try again. I'm sorry, the connection was bad. Okay, I try it again. So, um, in general, the hospital will decide which device, or the physician will decide which device will be used, and the, uh, um, the health insurance fund can uh, review these and can push that back to the hospital due to different reasons. Um, therefore, you have to have um, evidence in place and you need to explain why you use a specific device and specific treatment for these patients and these need to be documented um, by the hospital. Thank you, Gert. Um, again, Anastasius, feel free to contact any of us if you need to touch base with Gert, or you can, of course, talk, touch base with Gert directly. Um, one more question here um, from Daryl. Uh, we have a class one medical device, non-sterile, non-measuring. How do we locate an authorized representative in the EU? And do we need an authorized rep in each EU country? Maybe Gert again. Um, I, uh, I'm, uh, you don't need a representative in each country, um, but again, um, the legal requirements, the legal situation in each European country, it's different, so it makes sense to have uh, in the bigger countries um, subsidiaries or um, any representative uh, like a distrib distributor in place who is supporting you in your activity, in the first activities in the market. Thank you, Gert. That is it on our questions, actually. So I want to thank uh, all our attendees for their questions and uh, also, of course, our speakers, uh, Gabriel, uh, Stefan, and Gert. I'm just putting up my contact information in case you'd like to touch base with me if you have any uh, questions down the line. Uh, thank you for joining us. I want to wish everyone a, a great evening, a great day, and a, and a great rest of the morning. And uh, thanks for joining us. Goodbye.